Hello and welcome. I'm Kate Pela, Director of Programs and Artist Services at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. JCAL Presents is very excited to welcome you to our Building Equity live streaming event, Indigenous Peoples of the Caribbean, a focus on the Taino. I would like to thank the New York Community Trust for making the Building Equity program and this event possible. We are honored to present longtime resident of Queens, Roberto Mucaro Borero. Hi, Roberto. Okay. <laughs> An indigenous Taino chief of the Guainia tribe and a locally, nationally, and internationally respected human rights, cultural arts, and environmental advocate with over 20 years of public programming experience. Please stay after Roberto's talk to participate in a Q&A and remember to use your, your YouTube live chat. Also a reminder that we have a building equity survey that you can find on our jcal.org building equity link, our website. Please take that. And also um, just join us for all of our other programs that we have coming up. We have a number of them. Uh, Roberto will be leading us through an introductory look at the history, culture, and contemporary issues of the Taino people, who are a large part of the New York community, as well as the Caribbean. So Roberto, whenever you're ready, please begin, and thank you so much for putting this together for us. Bye. Ahom, Ituno Kate, Taiwe, Ituno Kena Atiaono, Diri Mukaro Aguebana, Wodikin Taino Daka. I just wanted to extend uh, quick greetings and thank you uh, to Kate. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Roberto Mukaro Borrero, and I'm a member of the Guainia uh, Taino community. Uh, with heritage that comes from the island of Boriquen, or what is today known as Puerto Rico. I'm really honored to be here uh, taking part in this session of uh, Building Equity, the online program series. And uh, this month we're highlighting uh, Caribbean Heritage Month. So I'm really uh, feeling good about being able to provide a little insight into the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. And uh, I'm going to be uh, receiving some help from uh, my friend Ben, who's uh, behind the scenes, and he'll be helping to uh, change the slides over for me. So, Ben, we can go to that first slide right now. Now, uh, for us, when we're talking, when we hear about the Caribbean, you know, oftentimes uh, images come to our mind, uh, vacations, um, large cultural celebrations of carnival and even films like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. But uh, a lot of people don't think about the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. Uh, most of the time, I, I'm going to go to the, to the next slide now, Ben. And uh, this slide that, that we have up now is giving you a, a little map. So when I, when you understand what I talk about the Caribbean, uh, what I'm talking about mainly is uh, the the homelands of the Taino people, of the indigenous Taino people, and those are mainly larger, the larger islands of the of the Caribbean region, which are islands like uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba and our uh, traditional homelands, the, the homelands of my ancestors also extended into the Bahamas. And interestingly enough, for folks who were not aware, into the southern tip of Florida. Now you could see that um, those islands are not so far apart if uh, you know how to uh, navigate the sea. And there was lots of that, but really, um, well, let's go to the next slide. When we talk about the Caribbean, and uh, we talk about sea navigation. You know, we often hear this uh, nursery rhyme. Many of us have heard it if, if you're in the, the US or, or other areas in, in the Caribbean itself. But you hear this, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, 
But really, that's about the extent of, of, of who you hear about. You hear about uh, Columbus, but you never really hear about um, the indigenous peoples or the native peoples that he met when he came over from a then emerging Europe and came over to this side of the world. And I want to include this slide because you know, there's a lot of um, stories that have emerged about Columbus over the centuries. And uh, really, folks don't even know what he looked like. There's various portraits of Columbus. And you could see a few here uh, being shared on this slide that gives you these uh, different uh, perspectives on who the, who the man might have been. Let's go to the next slide, Ben. Now, on this slide, you'll, you'll see this is probably a famous scene for many people. Uh, you see that this very ceremonious... Uh, looking Columbus and very clean looking uh, colonizers coming onto the shores. But if you look in the right hand corner uh, of the screen, well, maybe your left and my, my right, uh, you'll see some folks peeking out through the trees over there. And uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and so this next slide is another take on that uh, kind of mythological scene almost where Columbus is now reaching the new world. And, and uh, here's one that was uh, on a stamp from Nicaragua. And uh, again, you see this whole entourage as religious folks. Uh, on the other one, uh, you don't see it so much, but you see some conquistadors. So there's some you know, armed forces involved there. And then of course, in the corner, in, in uh, uh, looking even very small, almost like children, you see the indigenous peoples. And so, you know, this kind of presentation of this story, the so-called discovery of the new world or discovery of the Americas is really one that that's based on or that, that permeates this idea of these folks got here, they're the most important ones in the story. And uh, the, the native peoples or those little peoples who are off to the side there are just kind of bit players in, in the historical context of this. So we're really talking about visibility, and that's important as we continue on in our discussion because that in invisibility, that a lack of recognition, or that um, idea that we're something else uh, inferior to these folks who came over really plays out uh, as the story goes, goes along. But we're gonna switch to the next slide and this one talks about uh, indigenous peoples. Now, uh, I included a, a, a kind of definition here, but it's, it's really important to note that indigenous peoples uh, don't really have a legal definition. There's some definitions that are out there if you look up on, on dictionaries online, and there's also what they call working definitions in the international system. So uh, when indigenous peoples, uh, go to places uh, like the United Nations to talk about their rights. We see that uh, in the United Nations, they use a, a kind of like a definition that links to colonialism. And here's the one that I have here. It says, indigenous communities, peoples, and nations are those that having a historical continuity with pre-evasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories consider themselves distinct from other sectors of society now prevailing in those territories or parts of them. So that's kind of gives you an, uh, an idea of who we're talking about when we say indigenous peoples. And you'll hear these words almost interchangeable with that term indigenous peoples. Uh, some are uh, right here, Amerindian, American Indian, Native American, Native peoples, Aboriginal peoples, and First Nations. So all of these things relate to indigenous peoples. And of course, around the world, it can mean different things. If you're talking about Pacific Islanders like the Maori of New Zealand or Aboriginal Australians, you know, these are also within that rubric or within that, that category that we're saying indigenous peoples. But really, again, what I want to emphasize is that we're talking about peoples who have a pre-invasion and pre colonial society, right, before these other entities developed, these other political entities developed around them, surrounded them, and oftentimes uh, marginalized them. And this is no different uh, in the Caribbean.
Now we're going to go to the next slide. Um, this one should be uh, one that says New World Encounter. And now here again, there's some kind of rom romanticized, stylized meetings where you see uh, Columbus coming in. In the background of the black and white, you see there's a lot of soldiers there. And it's always like uh, the native peoples are, are amazed with little trinkets. And uh, Columbus is wowing them uh, with, uh, with his wares, right? And it's always, you know, th the reason why I bring up Columbus is like we're kind of tethered to that moment in history, right? That, that New World encounter. Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492, right? Columbus is there, and then there's an impact on the Indians, right? The Native Americans, the indigenous peoples, and that impact is not, is not a happy one. Uh, although our people openly received Columbus and these new visitors as they would any other visitors coming to their territories, uh, the exchange was not so pleasant on, on, on our end. But, uh, you know, Taino are often uh, connected to Columbus. And I think that that's especially important to talk about uh, in these times when you see a real fervor for the removal of Columbus statues going around, going on right now uh, in Queens, in New York, and around the country uh, in relation to uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, calls for racial justice. So our story is really important because we are the first ones who were impacted uh, by this New World encounter. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. This one's talking about the, Columbia, the Colombian exchange. So for those who are not familiar with this term, we're talking about transfer, right? You have uh, Columbus, who I mentioned earlier was coming over from and then emerging Europe. And this is important. Uh, to recall, because Europe at that time is not the Europe that we know today. We're talking about 500 years ago. Right at that time, Europe, or Spain in particular, who Columbus uh, was working for, a lot of uh, folks tried to link him to Italy, but really, although he was born in Italy, he took he undertook his, uh, his exploration under the banner of Spain and the countries and uh, the territories that he encountered he was trying to uh, enrich Spain because Spain had been uh, had just come out during that time, around that period, uh, out of an 800 year war, and it was uh, semi uh, religious, economic, and uh, this is what what they call this. Uh, it was actually a war with uh, the Islamic uh, territories or, or or peoples, and uh, they called they called those folks the Moors, or many people have named them the Moors afterwards. So there was like an eight hundred year battle. It was just kind of subsiding during that time before uh, Columbus, right right before his liftoff. So you have uh, a lot of the territories that were uh, formerly. Um, controlled or impacted uh, by uh, the Moorish nations, now, now reverting over to, uh, again, uh, these newly emerging uh, European powers, which were also Christian powers. So that was another difference at that time. So this, all this uh, that was going on during that 15th and 16th century, right, 1492, 15th century, is you have this transfer from that side of the world, right, which had largely depleted uh, meant much of its natural resources because of the warring state of that region. Uh, then they came over here to replenish that supply, enrich themselves, and build them up as uh, international powers. And of course, it began with Spain. So you see a transfer of plants, animals, culture, of course, human populations, technologies, and ideas. So let's go to the uh, next slide. And this is talking about quotes that Columbus himself uh, presented when he arrived in the so-called New World. Of course, it wasn't the New World to the indigenous peoples who have been there uh, since time immemorial, uh, but for Columbus and, and those folks who he was working with, uh, it was a new world for him. And of course, you know, there, there are the, um, it's well known right now that there are other folks who had come over previously, there was Leif Erikson uh, from the Nordic countries who, who made it over to this side of the world, but more north. Uh, but that wasn't really a colonial em enterprise like uh, Columbus had engaged in. And there is talk of, of others like the Chinese 
and people from Africa, but we're not going to get into that right now. We're really focusing on the Colombian encounter in the Caribbean, and right now we're going to just look at some quotes that Columbus himself uh, just was writing down in his journals at the time. So he describes the Caribbean itself as a paradise on earth. He says there's trees all along the river, beautiful and green, different from ours, with flowers and fruits, each according to their kind, many birds which sang very sweetly uh, of the people. He says they're free with all that they possess, and no one would believe it without have, having seen it. He's in here remarking around about the generous nature of uh, the indigenous peoples that he's meeting, uh, the Taino peoples. And he says here, anything that they have, if you ask for it, they never say no, rather they invite you to share it. And here, uh, this last quote on, on this slide, I certify to your highnesses that in all the world, I believe that there are no better people nor better land. They love their neighbors as themselves and have a speech that is the sweetest in the world and mild and always laughing. So this is what he's talking about, talking about my ancestors here, the giving nature, the sharing, the, um, the beauty of, of the environment. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, there's a reason why our folks uh, really felt uh, or really had this giving nature. If uh, you look at this slide here, here's uh, just a photo uh, giving you a little glimpse into still what's still very lush and prime land in that region. Uh, you know, there's an average temperature of around 80 degrees, the water temperatures are almost the same. And really this provided this, you could see in the background, way in the back, there's uh, mountains there with clouds, you know, the mountains, the trees, that's what provides the rain. And so you have this year round opportunity, a year for a year round growing system. You have the bounty of the sea, right? So the people were really, uh, you know, from Columbus's perspective, coming from a dry Iberia, well, that Iberian Peninsula where Spain is, very different climate, very different kind of trees. And, you know, he really sees this as paradise, right? And so there's there's things growing. There's all kinds of stuff happening. And so this, this nature, of course, the people had to work for it. It just didn't appear. The people also make an impact on the ground, but they had to work for these things. But, you know, to him, he's, he's seeing the, the very lush and, and very bountiful environment that my ancestors lived in. And so that's why he was saying those things. And uh, I'll go to the next slide to talk a little bit about uh, Caribbean indigenous peoples. Now, this slide gives you another uh, view of the Caribbean, and we could see uh, the interchange that was taking place. But before I go into really uh, talking about this slide, there's one thing that I also want to bring up. If you recall the quotes that I that I spoke about with Columbus, you know, there was a lot of quotes about how beautiful we were, how giving we were. But then right away, very soon afterwards, he talks about with 50 people, I could subjugate all of them. They would make good servants. And, and he uses this kind of quote. So right away, he's looking at the um, the environment. And he's looking at the people in a way that's almost commodifying them, like looking at them as uh, resources for the Spanish crown. And that's really important to remember because, again, as I mentioned just a little earlier, the Spanish crown was looking to uh, increase their power and empire. They were, they were relatively, their areas were depleted. And so they were looking uh, to increase those resources, increase their riches, and power in their region and beyond. So part of that um, deal that Columbus made with the sovereigns of Spain at the time was that he would go out and seek these new lands, seek new lands, really trying to find uh, a more direct route to the Indies or you know, following up on what Marco Polo did and trying to get uh, really to the spices and to the trade of Asia, right? And you know, the Indies, India, uh, this is where you get that term Indians from, although some other folks have had some pretty creative um, other theories about where the term Indian comes from. But really, that's that's the, uh, probably the, the most accurate, because it, that region on that side of the world was called the Indies, uh, 
right? And uh, you know, this is how we, we come up with the name. So now back to this this particular slide with this map and how our culture developed. Now you could see that the Caribbean itself, if you follow that chain of islands up from South America, uh, up through the Lesser Antilles and there, it's almost like a stepping stone. And for folks who were navigators, uh, they could really go from island to island coming off the mainland. So many of our ancestors were coming out of that Orinoco River Basin. You'll see that there near the uh, Warao, um, Guayana, the Venezuela, uh, Venezuela, Arawak, all these folks coming out into that Orinoco River Basin at the bottom. They come out uh, first into Trinidad and make their way up. But, you know, this is not a one-way road, right? This is not a one-way highway. It, this is the, the sea and the ocean. So folks were also coming up and coming across for many, many generations, thousands of years, coming across from Central America as well. And folks are going back and forth, trading. You could find evidence of this trade uh, all throughout the islands. And so... What I want folks to come away with on this one is really that the Taino have influences of all these of all these people that come up here. Although our language uh, is really most closely related to the Arawak language uh, that comes out of uh, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, uh, those places today, but where our language is really related to them in a way like um, you would find that uh, Latin that Arawak is like the root. Uh, the same way that Latin is a root for uh, languages like Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and French. They all come from this root, so there's similarities in the language. But our language was also influenced by folks coming over from Central uh, America as well. Uh, we were the neighbors, contemporaries of the Maya and others uh, from Central America. So we see influence of that in language and culture. So that's that. Let's go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, keep these maps in your mind. But uh, here, this next slide uh, really shows our folks uh, in their great canoa, or that's where you get the English word canoe. Remember, in the Columbia Exchange, uh, because we were the first indigenous peoples that uh, Columbus and the Spaniards encountered, they didn't have a lot of words for the things that they saw on this side of the world. There may have been something that looked similar, but really the words that we use kind of stuck and they uh, made it into and are still used many of these words in the Spanish language where people think those are Spanish words, but they're actually uh, words coming from the indigenous lexicon and also even in the English language. So you have a word like canoa, which is where you get the English word canoe. Uh, you have uh, another uh, word like uh, you might use this at this time of year a lot uh, after you have... Um, what we call in the Taino language barbacoa is where you get the English word barbecue. After you have you have the barbecue, you might feel a little full. You might want to take a rest in a hamaca, right, which is where you get the English word hammock from. But there's there's many more words. I'm just giving you a, a little bit of, of taste. So you see on the on one side here, you could see folks in that canoa, and now you have to imagine. Remember at that time. Folks were were really healthy, right? They weren't didn't have all the preservatives that we're having now. They were out there working outside every day. You know, there wasn't 7-Elevens, preservatives in the foods. You know, everything was organic. Like, uh, you know, we have to pay big prices for that now. But at that time, that was just a way of life, right? So those folks, uh, according to some of the Spaniards who were who arrived in the Caribbean around the time with Columbus, they said that some of the Taino Canoa could hold over 120 people. Although they saw some very small ones way out in the sea, and they would find maybe a lone uh, or, or, or two people in a, smaller, in a smaller canoe doing some fishing. Some of these canoes could hold over 120 people. And you would imagine that you know, 120 very strong people can move back and forth between these islands, especially when they understood the, um, the, how to read the stars, travel with that. They understood the wet weather patterns, uh, what time of year it was safer to go out on these longer journeys. And so that's why uh, the Taino language or what developed into what we call the Taino language today in those larger islands, and I'm talking about the greater Antilles mostly, although you find there are folks uh, scattered in and related to folks in the Lesser Antilles, 
the Taino were mostly in these larger uh, greater Antillean islands and the Bahamas. And I mentioned before, we had a few communities in the southern tip of Florida. So we were also here before the U.S. was actually formed. So we were never really uh, immigrants, as some folks try to paint it now. But our folks were going back and forth. And you can find today um, in the Spanish that's spoken, let's say, for example, in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, uh, we have a, a mountain in Puerto Rico called, and the forest called Yunque. And in, in Cuba, there's also a mountain called Yunque. And both of these uh, have to do uh, with uh, mountains that are covered in white clouds. That it really means it translates to covered white. And, um, you know, you find that because the Taino language and culture was spread uh, throughout those larger islands. We'll go to the next slide right now. Again, you'll see another, um, you'll see another map but also uh, you'll see some folks engaging in the bounty of the sea, some young uh, kids there, but also, again, highlighting that our people were traders. Uh, they were also, uh, you know, very adept at, at, at navigation. So they were going across that region, uh, interchanging with, indig with other indigenous peoples. But uh, they were also agriculturalists. And, th and this is really important because uh, this built up the communities uh, much more than than people give uh, really credit to. There's actually um, a story uh, that was told, uh, that was recorded at the time when uh, the Spanish were inflicting a lot of uh, hardship on the people. Because as you know, uh, unlike the folks here, Columbus didn't come to the New World to plant beans. He came to look for gold and to enrich uh, the emerging Spain and the monarchs there. So there's one uh, story uh, where... Uh, Columbus is talking to uh, one of these uh, Taino chieftains, uh, we say in our language, cacique. So he's talking to a cacique there, and uh, you know, this is after they started to impose these, these really horrific um, uh, institutions on the islands, really like almost like chattel slavery uh, or plantation society where they would give uh, uh, indigenous peoples, give them, uh, because you know they were now the subject of, of Spain. Uh, to uh, Spanish lords, and so he was. So when he was meeting with one of these chiefs, uh, he was saying, the chief was telling him, you know, if you guys just hold off on this gold, we could really feed you, everybody that you have here, and everybody that you have home back in your homeland, and we can enrich you that way. And they were looking to. Uh, he was looking to try to to find the way to help his people that were going through. Uh, those hardships because of that that gold fever that had overtaken the Spaniards, right? They were looking for this gold. They were looking to make themselves rich, to have uh, servants, and, and to go back to their homeland uh, as as a higher nobles or being part of the nobility. But uh, so that's there. So we're going to go to the next slide, just giving you some background there. And now you see here that our communities at the time, and this is all throughout those islands. So I'm not just talking about one island like like my own, uh, where my own family her heritage comes from, from the island of Boriqueng or Puerto Rico. But I'm talking about all the islands. You'll see a similarity in the social structure, in the economic structure, in the political structure. And so um, here you see some large communities. Many would be living by uh, the coastlines or by rivers. You know, some communities were specialized where if you had fishing communities, they may have done different things that, than communities up in the highlands. And so there was really an intricate trade system set up from community to community. And that didn't only happen uh, inter-island, meaning it didn't only that trade set up and that, that communication uh, and and sharing didn't take place just amongst communities that were neighbors. No, they would go throughout the island, and then also from island to island. So you you know you have to think about it in this way. The Taino uh, people at that time really had a, a diplomatic outlook uh, on life, and they understood that you know if we make relations with peoples, it's it would fit, we would fare much better. Uh, in strengthening our communities, because if you travel to another land, you know, somebody would be there and say, hey, you know, you guys are related to my cousin on this side, you know, this. And so, you know, there was this idea of going from community to community and the chiefs and the leaders at that time 
were really into uh, what they, you know, the arranged marriages, right? So they would ar arrange marriages between leaders of different communities. And this even continued uh, when the Spaniards arrived. Uh, they even exchanged uh, family relations with some Spaniards. And even uh, later on, as uh, enslaved Africans were brought in to the islands, uh, and as some of them broke free from their bondage, and where did they escape to? They came to the communities, to the indigenous communities. And the, more often than not, they were welcome there. They uh, were welcome within the communities as well. But let's go to the next uh, slide. So this next slide uh, that I'm going to show you here talks a little bit about the political structure. We saw how the people really um, engaged the environment right, engage the world around them through the fishing, through trading, through agriculture. You know, this idea of food sovereignty, of food security was so important as, as in the, the example that I, I shared with you about that one Taino chief or that cacique who wanted to, uh, try to convince the Spaniards to look at food as more important than gold. But right here we see uh, an example of two islands and this is how the political structure was. Each of these islands here, one uh, on the bottom, this is uh, the island of Boyo, uh, which is uh, on one side, people may have uh, called that one Quisqueya. Uh, some folks on the other side may have said Haiti, depending on the area that you were in. But overall, uh, there is uh, some consensus that the island was known as Boyo, which simply means home, right? And today that island is split apart between the Dominican Republic on one side and Haiti. Haiti or Haiti on the other side, still retaining its Taino name. Uh, Cuba as well also retains its Taino name. Uh, and even in the other countries that don't, Jamaica or Jamaica, another one as well, Bahamas, uh, another one that, that retained that Taino name. And even countries that don't, uh, that most people know who are from there are aware of the original name. That's why you hear in Puerto Rico, for example, people using the term Boriquen or they use this term Boricua that derives from the term Bori King, which is one of the, uh, the ways that the people described uh, the island. And so these, uh, what, what's important in these photos here is talking about the uh, political structure or the territories. So there were various territories that had uh, political leadership. And so uh, here in Puerto Rico, you see in the bottom part, Guainia territory, which is one of the largest and most politically influential uh, in the region. And so all of these had uh, what they call like a, a grand chief, uh, I guess we can term it like that, or a cacique, uh, who was kind of like the go-to person uh, at the more, that, that more national or territorial level. They had their own villages, but in those territories, there was many, many villages with many chiefs and leaders, right? But they would go from that local level to then they would go to this larger level and try to take care of their differences. And those leaders or, or caciques, you see in the bottom, you see a depiction there uh, of, a, of a chief. But in this top one, I wanted to show uh, as well that it's really important to note because that one is a depiction of another cacique who was named Anacaona. And right there, this shows you the difference, uh, one of the ideological differences uh, between Taino and the Spaniards who had arrived was because even uh, women could attain this high level uh, of community responsibility or the, the role of a chief, right? So Anacaona was just one example. And, and it wasn't, you know, to be honest, it was not as widespread as uh, having male chiefs. But, you know, what I want to emphasize is that, yes, there were women chiefs, there were women leaders, they were sought after uh, for counsel. They were respected, and uh, they were known as chiefs. And even the Spaniards acknowledged that uh, when they arrived because they were very surprised at the level of freedom that Taino women or the indigenous women of these islands had, which was very different uh, from what they were used to in Spain. Remember, Spain, um, it's really a, a patriarchal culture that was coming over. And what I mean by that is that all the power, right, in community um, it was really vested in the male side. And so you have uh, in their uh, religious um, interpretations of, of who they call their creator or God, God was always the father, right? And then that power of God was transferred down to the king, 
who was supposed to be God's representative on earth, and then down to the males and the families. So women didn't really have a voice uh, at that time uh, in 15th and 16th century uh, Europe and even beyond that. But it was different in, in Taino society because we saw that energy, that beginning energy, that creator energy uh, in the very beginning when that energy first moves and starts to create, we see it through the female uh, perspective or the female line. So even the chiefs that were uh, had hereditary leadership, their leadership would come from the female line. And so, uh, you know, that's really important to note. It didn't mean that the, the females were always the leaders, but the leadership came from the female line. There's even a term in the Taino language and in the um, Islander language, we say inaruni, and that's the word for truth. And it's linked to the word, uh, Taino word for woman, or one of the words for woman or women, uh, which is uh, inaru or inaruno. So inaruni means truth because, um, you know, at the end of the day, you always know who your mother is. And so that's the truth, right? That that's where the truth is, is uh, really vested in there. We're going to go to the next slide and you'll see here an example of some of the ceremonial activities or the gatherings. You know, there is this idea that, that we see now when we think about indigenous peoples, especially if you come from uh, North America, you think about powwow and how uh, native peoples come together. Well, you know, this is a long tradition of our folks getting uh, together for social, uh, religious uh, activities. And in our uh, Taino language, we say areto, areto. And uh, here, is where you would get a lot of the knowledge in the communities, people, the song, the dance, the ballads, right? The history, the great deeds of their ancestors uh, going, um, going forward. So this is, um, you know, how they would express this singing, playing instruments, you know, uh, communing. This is where the, the kids would meet, where relationships were formed or, or confirmed. Uh, this is how uh, people would be greeted when you had uh, visitors coming to the community. Uh, they would always put together an areto or some kind of, of social uh, religious ceremony, ceremonial activity where, you know, really the best of the community, you know, our culture uh, could come out, right? And, uh, you know, this is one of the things. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, they would have a lot of these activities in what we would call bate. And here's one, uh, the color uh, photo here, uh, shows some of the bate. The, this one is from uh, the Caguana Ceremonial Park in Puerto Rico, in the town of Utuado. Again, another town with, um, with a Taino name. And you, so you see uh, these ball courts that were, um, I guess, restored uh, by the local archaeologist or the Institute of Culture. Uh, in Puerto Rico, and so folks can go visit that that place. Now, Taino don't have control of, of this place uh, today, and it's unfortunate because there's a lot of um, uh, misuse of the parks, uh, but, uh, you know, we do access it on occasion, and, uh, you know, this is where a lot of these ceremonial activities would happen. And then you see this, uh, this gentleman on the right with a ball. This is the other thing that was an, uh, important that happened in these bate. The, um, the ball here uh, and this game that was played in this court we, we, in the bate is called batu. And uh, interestingly enough, this was not only a sport, all right? Uh, they, they would, the Spaniards were, were, were amazed uh, watching people play uh, batu. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, in a way, similar to volleyball or soccer. Uh, ex like different from volleyball, that way you couldn't touch it with your hands, but you could use your elbow, you could use your hip, similar to games that uh, 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 that you might have heard uh, in Central America, or the Mayan ball games, or or the other uh, folks who used to engage in those in those activities. Uh, men and women uh, could play against each other or on co-ed teams. Sometimes there would be teams of just men against men, women against women, uh, young people. But the other thing that was really important about this particular game is that it would also be used as an adjudication method. So sometimes when uh, communities would have a dispute, they would use the game of Batu to actually um, adjudicate or, or to come to a decision uh, 
on on what that dispute was about. In other words, on whose side uh, that dispute would be, right, and whose favor. So they would use they would use that um, that ball court for that for that uh, uh, opportunity. So the the idea of take it to court is really interesting in the, in this in this context because you're actually taking it in this sense to the ball court, and the people would honor. Uh, these decisions because this was also connected to the spirituality of the people. And much like other indigenous peoples around the world, the, the spirituality was not just limited to, um, you know, just one structure on a certain day of the week, but it was really uh, infused in the everyday life of the community. So in the sports, in the art, we'll go to the next uh, slide and you will see some uh, examples here of Taino stone carvings. And all, all these things have, have meanings and, and have uh, importance in the culture. But you also can see the, the level of artistry uh, in these, these carvings here uh, to show you that you know, the, the people were really interested in arts, in music, as I mentioned in the Aretu, the singing, the playing of instruments, that, that taking time for artisanship and reflecting on their spiritual understanding of the world and on all the energies or spirits, uh, some people might say now, uh, that were around them and shared the world because everything in this Taino paradise, as, as Columbus called it, uh, was infused with spiritual energy. We'll go to the next slide and you can see another example here, a wooden carving. Um, we can go right to the next slide. Uh, another example, you see some weaving techniques. And here on uh, this slide, there's a, a wooden bench that you can see uh, carved out there. Again, not just for artistic purposes, but these would be used by chiefs uh, when they were having the areto so that they could receive visitors. Uh, they would uh, oftentimes leave one empty for ancestors or spirits who would, who would also be viewing uh, these uh, ceremonial activities. Uh, but also they would use these benches in spiritual um, uh, initiatives, like when they were really communing uh, on a spiritual nature, they would use these benches uh, uh, called duho, duho as well. But on, on the other side, you see this woven, uh, this woven what we call semi, or it's almost like an icon, like a spiritual icon. And then here one uh, there is another semi that's beaded. And uh, what's interesting about that one is that it seems to show uh, some of the Colombian exchange there. Like there's elements of the indigenous uh, heritage, but also some elements of the other heritage, the other peoples that came to the islands, the Spaniards and uh, the Africans as well in that particular one. So you see that our folks are starting to incorporate some of these things, which is you know not, not so... Um, hard to imagine. I mean, if you're using, uh, let's go to the next slide. If you're using um, stone implements uh, to make your carvings, you know, the, the idea of being open to trade with others uh, who have metal access, for, for example, that might be easier. This is why our folks really saw the Spaniards in the beginning as, as uh, you know, something positive because they thought it was going to be uh, you know, an opportunity for trade in items that they didn't have. But here you could see some works in clay, uh, these magnificent uh, stone uh, jewelry pieces, again, relating to their uh, um, spiritual uh, world, the, the connection to the spiritual world as well. Let's go now to the next slide. Now that you've seen that, you know, the people have music, arts, culture, stories, history, genealogy, a way, uh, a way of looking at, at their, their heritage. We see that uh, here, that Columbus quote again. Remember, these are the people that he thought were so beautiful and so sweet and that would give them everything that they, they, they have. Now, after all that you've just seen, here's what he writes down in his diary. It appears to me that the people are ingenious and would be good servants. And I, have, um, and I am of the opinion that they would, be re they would readily uh, become Christians as they appear to have no religion. Again, as I said, their whole life was imbued uh, with spirituality. Uh, it was just not the same or not as uh, indoctrinated as those uh, folks who were coming uh, over from Europe uh, were. We'll go to the next slide. Um, here's another quote from Columbus. 
uh, with 50 men, I could subjugate them all and make them do everything that is required of them. Remember, again, they were looking for gold. They wanted folks to go out and find gold for them. They were, they were really enslaving the people at that time. So the, the first folks who were enslaved in this hemisphere are my Taino ancestors. You know, right away, Columbus made enemies. I'm not sure if everybody's aware of that. But uh, in, that, in the time when he was going back, he took Taino people with him to, to Spain to parade them before the court uh, with some of the items that, that he found as exotics, you know. Uh, many of them died along the way. Some we've lost uh, contact with, we lost contact with, and, and we don't know what happens to those folks. There's a lot of theories about that. But um, here you could see some of the atrocities that were committed, and we know that these atrocities were committed against the people by Columbus, uh, oftentimes under his direction, or uh, some of the men that were that were under him, you know, his underlings, and that would include uh, really horrific tortures uh, if they didn't come with gold, uh, within a certain amount of gold uh, that they were required, that the Spaniards were imposing upon them. Uh, they would cut off their noses, their hands, and there were eyewitnesses at the time who wrote down uh, these atrocities, who wrote down what was happening, and they didn't think it was right. So there were a few instances where people were saying that, you know, this is this shouldn't be happening, right? This is not the right thing to do. So when you hear about Columbus today and that how we cannot um, judge Columbus by the standards of uh, by the standards of today. We don't have to do that. We can judge them by the standard, standards of that time and, and know that people were speaking out against the atrocities that were committed. Here's another thing that, that you see in the other slide with those folks, my ancestors, being hanged. And they would hang them 13 at a time. Why 13? Because it represents the 12 apostles and Jesus. And I don't know if, if that's really what Jesus was intending uh, as a way to uh, spread his message. And while some people might think that that's you know, a harsh thing to say, again, this is the reality of what, what happened at that time, which is why we were so uh, uh, against, why so many of our people are against uh, these Columbus statues, this glorification. This is not, a, this is not a, a instance to erase people from history or anything against the Italian-American community. No, it's about this particular individual and the genocide that was occurred occurring at that time. And we still are suffering the impacts of that genocide today. Next slide. You could see here um, two instances where, uh, again, displaying how uh, my ancestors really looked at diplomacy as, as the way to go, not, um, not warfare. Of course, they could engage in warfare, but they always tried to talk uh, to people to really come to some agreement here. That one uh, cacique that I spoke about earlier, that, that female leader, Ana Caona, is being hung on a tree. What the Spaniards did was they said, okay, you know, you guys, you're, you're, um, you're resisting us, and uh, we want to try to be friends, and we want to try to work it out. So why don't you call all the leaders uh, from all the communities on, on the island there in the uh, in Boio or, or Kiskeya, Haiti, and we'll meet them there, we'll talk, and we'll straighten all of this stuff out. And so uh, when the leaders got in there, the Spaniards barricaded the doors, they burned, they burned the hut that they were in, the meeting hall that they were in, and as people were exiting, you know, trying to escape the, the, the horrific flames, they would, uh, they would murder them, assassinate them on the way out. On the other side, there's a famous story here with this photo, with this drawing, rather, of uh, Cacique Hatue, and uh, his uh, an eyewitness was there when uh, he was about he was um, about to be uh, executed by the Spaniards for leading resistance. And in other words, if you've heard stories of peaceful Arawaks, right, or peaceful Tainos that we didn't fight, that's not true. We led resistance against the. We just didn't roll over on this stuff. There was actual resistance. Uh, Hatue was was captured in Cuba. And right before they were ready to burn him at the stake, they asked uh, the priest asked him uh, if he wants to be baptized. And he says, well, why do I want to be baptized? Well, he says, well, you can't go to heaven uh, if you're not baptized. So then Hatue says, well, where do the Spaniards go? And then he says, um, well, of course, they go, to, they go to heaven because they're baptized. And he said, well, you know what? Just let me burn because I don't want to go anywhere where they are. Again, uh, just to show you, uh, this is a, an eyewitness uh, took this down. Next slide. 
This next slide is uh, shows a monument uh, to another cacique, a Taino cacique, Enriquillo, or sometimes known as Henry. In the Taino language, we say uh, Guaracuyo. And uh, Henry was another one who led a resistance on the island of, of Boio, again, uh, that one between the uh, Dominican Republic and, and Haiti. He led a resistance there from 1519 to 1533. And what's so important about Enriquillo, because his resistance was so successful. People were just coming to him, Tainos uh, and uh, Africans who, who were freed from their who were free from their bondage. They had escaped that bondage, running into the mountains and gathering with with Enriquillo. Uh, he achieved the first treaty uh, in the Western Hemisphere between indigenous peoples and Europeans. All right, so that's what's important about that. And he had to meet them. He was he was smart. He saw what happened to his uh, to his elders and others in the community when he uh, negotiated that peace treaty. He was across a ravine so that they couldn't capture him. There was a there was a, a ravine that separated him from the Spaniards. Next slide. By the uh, 1540s, uh, there was so much outcry about what was going on in the islands that they instituted what they called the new laws of the Indies. And this law was designed to protect uh, the indigenous peoples or the Indians or the Indios at that time, right? And restrain the folks who were trying to make them serfs, I guess, the what they call in, in these encomiendas. And these were, I had mentioned them earlier, where, you know, folks are uh, distributed, uh, communities are distributed among Spaniards and they're supposed to work for them. And this is where you get these terms like, uh, Peon, peons and and jefes, you know the 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 peones and the patrones, you know the 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 leaders of the plantations and the and the folks who are working the plantations, right? And so this is what was going on. So this law was supposed to um, quell that, stop those cruel practices. It prohibited it prohibited uh, the the enslavement of indigenous peoples. It it, it prohibited uh, an encomienda to be uh, inherited to family members, right? And the Spaniards were so against this, uh, they actually, in Peru, they actually uh, sparked a rebellion uh, against the crown because of this. Now, in Puerto Rico, what's important about this is that there's a real uh, interesting story. Now, um, when these new laws of the Indies were being read on the island of Puerto Rico, they read them in, in what we know as uh, the area of San Juan today. And so when the bishop was getting ready to read that, he had informed his uh, folks to gather up uh, whatever Indians were around in the town, whatever Indios were there, so that they could read uh, the new laws saying that they were free uh, uh, at that time. And so, you know, whoever was around that community, maybe somebody was painting the house, maybe somebody was tending horses, maybe another one was working in a field. The, the, there was about 60 natives that they had gathered up uh, in San Juan to hear this decree of their freedom. And uh, that's who was there that day. Now, this didn't mean that there was only 60 people left in the whole island. But however, historians have used that, that little uh, bit of information to say, oh, it's so sad that by the time in the 1540s that the, uh, Spain had freed the, the natives from, from slavery, there was only 60 people left on the island to uh, to um, enjoy that their newfound freedom. And that certainly wasn't the case. That's what we see over and over again in the historical record, manipulation of uh, the historical record in favor of uh, the oppressors. So um, natives would be categorized as uh, blacks, and uh, this way they could still legally be enslaved because at that time uh, slaves were not uh, freed in the Caribbean as yet. They, they didn't receive that, that official freedom. Let's go to the next slide. And here's the other loophole from the, um, here's a loophole from the new laws. Now, they, they were talking about the freedom of the native peoples. However, any indigenous person who revolted against the Spaniards, right, or who they say or who was claimed to be engaged in any kind of sodomy or immoral act, could then uh, be classified as Carib, which is a, a, another classification for indigenous peoples in the region, and they could be made slaves. So here you get this dichotomy of good Indian and the bad Indian, right? And, and I took this photo out here because that, that idea of good Indian and bad Indian even permeated to Hollywood where they depict 
uh, our relatives, the Kalinago and other Carib, Carib, quote unquote Carib, who are our linguistic and cultural relatives as fierce cannibals, right? So the, again, you have this story about peaceful Arawaks and then the fierce cannibals in the Caribbean. And you see uh, Johnny Depp running from the cannibals. And actually our folks uh, uh, protested this, this uh, depiction in the film because it is uh, mythological, has nothing to do with the reality of the people. We're gonna go to the next slide. And I'm going back to Bori King, uh, to Puerto Rico for a moment. Uh, you see the, the chief sums there, but what another interesting thing that happens, uh, you know, as we move on from the new laws, and then we have to remember in the 1540s, they never really found the gold that they wanted to find in the Caribbean islands. So by the 1540s, folks were already heading out into per to Peru, Mexico, and other areas to look for that big pot of gold that they wanted. They so much so in, in Puerto Rico, for example, they instituted probably one of the harshest immigration laws uh, possible, where they where they said that any Spaniard found leaving the island to go to Peru or other places to search for gold would have their foot cut off because they wanted to make sure that the island would remain in Spanish control. They were afraid that the island would, one, either revert back into indigenous uh, hands or that another uh, emerging colonial power would try to come and, and take over uh, that strategic point of land. But here's the interesting thing from Puerto Rico. By the time we get to the uh, end of the 18th century, in 1799, um, there was a census that was conducted in one area of the island uh, to note that there was over 2,300 uh, native peoples living in the Central Cordillera uh, region or the Central Mountain region, more, more closely to the western side of the island. And that's just one area of census. And that place today in that western area still known as Las Endierras or the Indian lands. And it's still you see in Tierra Fria and Tierra Alta. There's there's so many of uh, uh, references to that. In the year 1800, uh, here again the genocide continues, albeit in a different form. The the term Indio or Indian was officially re removed from uh, as a racial category in the census, and uh, that was changed to a category called color pardos libres or free people of color. So that's how. In one year, there was several thousand natives. Uh, it was understood that they were on the island. And in the next year, all of those folks disappear. And this plays into the story of indigenous peoples disappearing from the Caribbean. And you see this not only in Puerto Rico, but you see this in each and every island, how the historical record is manipulated. Let's go to the next slide. So now that we know that native peoples were still around much longer and, and still here, that you could see some of the influences in contemporary Caribbean society. You see the making of, of cassava bread or cassabe. This is the bread made from yuca or manioc. Again, one of our traditional staples of our culture. All right. Uh, you could see the making of items such as the hamaca still. Again, you know, these hamaca, so ingenious that the Spaniards adopted them. It changed the shipping industry because folks could now use hamaca as their bunks instead of a regular type of bed, so that saves space. And you see influences of uh, down in the corner there. These, uh, these are musical instruments. In Taino, we say guaje, but uh, people uh, also know them as guido, guicharo, and these are used in Latin American music. They're like a, a rasp, and the uh, the traditional style would be a gourd rasp. But now, even if you look at Latin percussion instruments, they use they make them out of metal, and it's this rasping ch -ch 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 sound. And then you see some of the basketry uh, that's still used uh, throughout the islands. And, and there's there's so much more of a legacy throughout the islands. But I just wanted to give you a little glimpse. Here's another. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. I was mentioning that, you know, um, our folks were uh, taken off the census. And so some of our elders, as uh, we started to uh, reassert ourselves and reaffirm our culture uh, in, in the wider world, you know, amongst our, ourselves and in the a wider world, uh, one of our, our, our elders, Naniki Reyes, uh, Boriken Taino, had said, you know, the same way they wrote us out of here, Write our kin. You know, they taught us to read. We, we participated in, in the system, and now we're going to use that system to also highlight um, our, our community once again and use that to uh, um, instill some pride in the community. So, one way uh, in Puerto Rico.
Mexico, for example, uh, we use the um, the U.S. Census of the current U.S. Census. So if you did, if you are or an Arawak or a Carib and, and you want to acknowledge that the U.S. Census, you can do that uh, because the census defines uh, American Indians. American Indians as any indigenous peoples who have a pre-colonial history in the Americas from North, Central, and South America, including the Caribbean. And so about uh, 20,000 people in Puerto Rico identified themselves as American Indian in the 2010 census. And that's a 49% increase uh, than uh, the one in the uh, 2000. So right now we're, we're uh, Taino people are actively engaged in that census uh, count in Puerto Rico. And you see here, you would mark off American Indian, and then you would write in the term Taino uh, as the tribe for those who haven't filled out their census and want to be acknowledged uh, for their heritage. Let's go to the next slide. Now, our folks today, you know, we're in, 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 engaged in so many issues, just like many other indigenous peoples. You know, that that genocide and that colonial oppression still impacts our, our society. So, you know, our, our way of life has been impacted. Our spiritual views on the world have been impacted. Our access to land, territories, and resources have been, act, uh, have been impacted. And all these amount to human rights violations against our folks. So, you know, we're trying to act today, Taino people, at the local, national, and international level to raise the visibility of our issues, right? One is that our depiction and these uh, false claims that our folks don't exist. You know, how can you exist when you're not uh, providing an opportunity for us to voice who we are? And you see, as we were taking off censuses, many countries in the Caribbean today don't, uh, don't differentiate between the indigenous peoples and the rest of the, what we call civil society, right? Uh, with the exception of the island of Dominica, uh, Puerto Rico, because, you know, we have the U.S. census where we can uh, write ourselves in there. And even Trinidad today is another one. Uh, maybe some in, in St. Vincent as well. But uh, most of the countries really don't focus on the indigenous question. There's like the indigenous peoples are talked of in the past tense, not in the current tense. However, we do have organizations in the Caribbean. Uh, there's the CADO, the Caribbean Amerindian Development Organization. There's United Confederation of Taino People. There's Caribbean Organization of Indigenous Peoples. And all these organizations are active in bringing, one, bringing our peoples together, our disparate communities uh, uh, together again across uh, inter-island and across the islands. So we all work together in various ways. And then, you know, we also have to understand that Tainos have a diasporic a community as well. In other words, that we're not just in the Caribbean anymore, because you remember the economic situations in many of these islands forced many of our to seek out other opportunities to better them to better their lives. You know, coming from again impoverished backgrounds, right, where um, maybe their rights weren't as as uh, well respected, right, in a sort of class uh, warfare. That was uh, that occurs uh, oftentimes. So many people leave those uh, their islands, just like other folks, and seek out new lands. But interestingly, again, as I said, since the Taino homelands also included the southern tip of Florida, you know, we've always had a connection uh, to this part of uh, North America, to um, to these lands that we call now United States of America. But you can see our folks active uh, back home. Uh, you see this black and white photo of uh, one of our community el elders, Doña Barin Chéverez, who was really, uh, really at the helm of, of bringing back some of our uh, traditional artisanship uh, through the pottery, uh, making many of our folks are, are engaged in that. And we have some tremendous, tremendous artists. We have stone carvers, there's, there's weavers, there's folks who are working on language. I mean, this is all happening, and we see this real reemergence or reaffirmation of, uh, of indigenous heritage in the Caribbean. Some you'll see right here that um, in this middle one at the bottom, some you might see some of our folks at a local powwow here. It's, and uh, you'll see there right next to them, the Taino, uh, Taino flag from the United Confederation of Taino People uh, being uh, walked in a, a powwow with other indigenous native flags. And you see that same flag uh, with one of our brothers there at Standing Rock. And I'm sure many of you uh, recall the situation that happened at Standing Rock when there was human rights violations where the, the Lakota people 
were, were um, bringing attention to the human rights violation as a pipeline was going to go through their territory, and they opposed that, but yet that pipeline got pushed through it, uh, even though they didn't want it there. And so you see a Taino flag amongst the other flags flying there uh, in solidarity with other indigenous peoples. So, you know, this last photo in this uh, grouping here is uh, some of our, uh, myself, along with Ty Pelly, Damon Curry, uh, and Hatwe Curry, uh, at the United Nations, uh, taking part in uh, meetings there. That was at one of the uh, sessions of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues that happen uh, that happens annually at the United Nations. It's another opportunity to engage in standard setting, uh, in uh, in speaking out about our specific issues. Again, if we don't do this. Uh, who's going to do it for us? So that's why we have to come and speak out about these issues. And so that gives you a little bit of idea about some of our past, the trajectory, how Columbus impacted our communities, why we're not in favor of those statues today. Um, and this, you know, this is a, this is an important subject for uh, going on across this idea of racial justice. You know, right here you see the Caribbean, Caribbean Heritage Month. All this stuff is intertwined, interrelated. You know, how how all of these things go together. And you look back, and it goes right back to that 500 years ago, uh, this idea of racial justice. Because remember, uh, Columbus didn't only enslave uh, indigenous Taino. The, the transatlantic slavery began with Columbus and the Caribbean. So African Americans have nothing to celebrate uh, about with Columbus either. We're going to go to the last slide, slide here. And uh, I just want to say, uh, Taino Daka. You know, I am Taino. Uh, this is a little Taino language lesson for you, uh, courtesy of the United Confederation of Taino People. Say hahom in the Taino language. Thank you for your patience, for listening to me. And uh, gracias in Spanish. You can connect with me on uh, Twitter, also on Instagram. And I think at this time, uh, we're going to open up to some questions. I think we have about till 8.30 uh, before this session is over. So if we, um, you know, we'll look on our chat the um i'm gonna look on this chat here my goodness i see a lot of activity uh thank you for everyone who's been writing in uh let's see a lot of people are excited i want to see if there's uh, any questions that i might be able to address uh yeah indigenous uh people are called in trinidad and tobago called arawak yeah i mentioned that in, the, in there uh for those interested yep I see there's a live streaming uh, coming up, both of the parents. I would love to learn which book I can find this map in. Okay, uh, I'm not sure which is the map you're talking about, but there are uh, some online. And if you can contact me either through the uh, Instagram or through Twitter, um, I can get you that information. And uh, yeah, some folks didn't know how, how, um, how large the canoes can get or the canoa can get. Uh, let's see, somebody lost a live feed. Been waiting to hear about the Tainos from Haiti, but nothing came out. Um, they fought and hit Africans. Yeah, I mentioned that, that uh, in a lot of uh, where I was talking about Haiti in particular, I mentioned the island of Boil, uh, because at that time, it was there was no dividing line. You know, some people on one side of the island called it uh, Keskeya. Some other folks uh, called it Haiti. But again... Uh, it was not divided in the way that it is now, right? So, uh, you know, when I talked about the culture, what went on, you know, Anacaona, these things are, are, some of these things took place in what would be called the uh, Haiti today, or what we know as Haiti today. And so all of what I've been talking about related to Haiti and to Jamaica and to Cuba and to the Bahamas, et cetera. So um, let's see. Uh, let's see for some others. If you're enrolled with a co uh, college, check the library. Okay, that's good. How did the colonizers and indigenous people communicate? How did they learn each other's languages? Interesting. That's a great question. Right in the beginning, uh, there was probably a lot of sign language going on. So there wasn't really a lot of understanding. That's why when um, you hear that uh, Spaniards were making uh, assumptions about what Taino people were talking about or how we believed or what we, how we viewed the world, uh, really that's a lot of assumption. And you see that uh, play out when uh, later historians were attempting to uh, 
uh, come up with definitions for our language. Remember, our language is related to the Arawakan language, but we have a lot of influence from Central America as well. And so um, not understanding that or not, they would come up also in putting their own bias in the language. So for example, we understand uh, uh, one spiritual entity, uh, Yokahu Bagua Maurokoti. You know, we would see it one way. Or when we talk about the, the hurricane, right? They would also view these things like they would see the Semis or that as diabolical because in their way, we were not following their religion. So these were idols. These were different things. Uh, they really didn't understand our culture. It wasn't about worship. It was about respect and acknowledgement, right? It was about our compacts, our spiritual connections, and um, these compacts, these covenants that were made with the world around us and which allowed us to have and live in a region like the region our ancestors lived in. So um, how did they communicate? Mostly through the sign language. Then, of course, they would learn each other's language. The Taino were actually used as, uh, you know, enslaved. Remember, I talked about that enslavement. And some of them were actually used as interpreters as they went around for, to island to island, right? And then some Spaniards also learned the language as well. And this is how many Taino words end up being incorporated into the language of Spanish and English today. Okay, so um, I'm going to look down for some more. There's a lot of good uh, comments here, people recommending books. Uh, fascinating. Uh, some say there are still Tainos in Haiti. Uh, yes, we do know that some folks who uh, identify themselves in their heritage. You know, it's, it's important to know that, you know, when we're talking about indigenous heritage, this is a link, right? We know from, um, from DNA testing, that there still is a biological link, no matter what anybody says, you know, uh, that the Tainos are wiped out or that indigenous peoples in the Caribbean were wiped out if they don't want to use the term Taino. But we know because of DNA testing that there is a biological link between many peoples across the Caribbean to our indigenous ancestors. And so why is it that, you know, if we know that our ancestors um, welcome the other people into their communities if they came and became part of the communities, right? Not that they welcome into the communities and then hope that they would eradicate the culture. No, they welcome into the communities and then they realize they were, the thing that they ask is that they would become part of the communities, learn the language, learn the traditions. And so many people did this. So in the way of our ancestors, they weren't looking at color the same way that people are looking at it today, right, with these kind of biases. Our folks were looking at trade partners, ways to strengthen communities, as long as our culture was able to be kept. And we would incorporate things from other people's culture. It was not like this homogeneous, like, doctrine that, okay, everything had to be this way. We always had room to um, advance or or at least try something different. I don't want to use the word advance, I guess, because then it makes us look like we were primitive. But obviously, you can see that our folks were not primitive. We had a high art. We had political structures. Uh, we had this uh, diplomatic capability that spanned across a large land and water region, right, to go into other areas and communicate and engage in trade with uh, indigenous peoples who didn't even speak our language. So that's uh, another another um, aspect of it. So I hope I answered that question. I'm still looking at some other questions. Um, okay, there's people talking about the... Can you tell me... What can you tell me about the Arawak in Curaçao? Was it the same kind of treatment? Um, as far as I understand, yes. I don't know as much about those folks. Uh, I don't know if there's a real... Um, indigenous organization uh, per se there, but um, you know, perhaps we could look at that um, a little more in the past. And you know, I mentioned when these Spaniards came in and they came in to do these encomiendas or this, this kind of like semi-slavery serfdom type things, you know, our folks, I also mentioned that uh, we resisted. So our folks were part of that. So many of our folks died uh, from that warfare, but that wasn't the only way also died from uh, diseases that were brought in uh, from that side of the world uh, to this side of the world that we didn't have immunity from. And, you know, that idea of immunity and diseases, now we're all getting the reality of that now in this uh, COVID pandemic. So, you know, it, that, this stuff has been going on for a while. 
But um, that was another way many of our folks were wiped out. But again, this, I'm not talking about a complete wiping out of peoples. There's, there's evidence upon evidence, uh, if you don't want to believe me, that you could just research yourself and find uh, all these things. It's a way that people interpret history. You know, history is interpreted uh, by the oppressor or by the quote-unquote winners, right? And so they don't really talk to the folks who, who didn't do so well uh, in, in that Colombian exchange. But we're there. Many of our peoples, you know, we're, we're blessed in the sense that many of our people still live on their ancestral homelands, you know, whether it be in Bori King or any of the other islands. I mean, you know, we still live in that area. We're trying to build ourselves up now, and we hope that, you know, this information that we're providing, you know, if you're not engaged or if you're just interested, you know, that this will provide some kind of inspiration for you to learn more and also to correct people. When next time you hear about all oh, those Indians in the Caribbean, they were wiped out, you know, now you know that that's not the case, that our people continue uh, on. I'm going to keep continue um, scrolling down. Uh, let's see what resources are there for elementary level. There are a few. There are a few books out there for elementary level. Again, um, we're trying to do our own now because many of these folks have not consulted with us, and that's another thing. You know, folks who are writing books and, and and doing things about the Caribbean consult with indigenous peoples. Seek out a Caribbean indigenous organization. You know, to get the real story, to get to get in touch the, where we could help you with these things, and also find some benefit for. Our, our communities back home and in the diaspora. Let's see here. Are there Taino people in Suriname? The Taino people are not in Suriname, but they are our relatives. They would be the Lokono. The Lokono Arawaks would be our closest relatives in, uh, in South America. And you don't always only find those Lokono in Suriname. You find them in Guyana. You find the, another small community in Venezuela. You find another community in uh, French Guyana. So all those folks are our relatives. We have a direct connection to them linguistically and culturally. And uh, as I mentioned through these Caribbean indigenous organizations, we've already done interchange over the last 20 years at least, uh, reconnecting um, those ancestral ties, treaties. I mentioned the United Confederation of Taino people. And this was one of the ways uh, that we, this one of the vehicles that we've used to enter into treaties with um, other indigenous peoples from the, from the Caribbean region and to help raise our visibility at the international level. Now, I saw something else that was really interesting. Somebody said something about federal recognition. Now, federal recognition, if you, if you don't know, is something that is a terminology that's used in the United States. It's not something really in the in the Caribbean unless you're talking about the island of Dominica, because the island of Dominica has the only official indigenous reserve in the Caribbean today. That's the only official homeland for indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. It's not the only place where indigenous peoples of the Caribbean exist, but it's one government reservation per se found on the island of Dom Dominica in the Lesser Antilles. Now, somebody was talking about federal recognition. So in the context of like Puerto Rico, for example, we're, we are not, as Tainos, recognized under the BIA structure. However, we have, as I mentioned, and uh, partnered officially with the U.S. Census, which is a federal agency. They've recognized our, our participation, and we've been able to raise uh, awareness and uh, the visibility of Taino people through that process. So that is one form that we have been recognized. And there are other forms, too. And if you look... Uh, at some of the work of the UCTP or the United Confederation of Taino People, you'll see some other ways that we've been recognized. Again, not BIA recognition, but remember, we are the first peoples in the hemisphere to be called Indians. We have every right to call ourselves American Indians because we are indigenous to the Americas. It's not just the United States. It's not the only America. It's North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean is part of that. So we are part of that. Now, uh, Here's another one. Do you have any encouraging words for young black and brown people looking to reconnect and reclaim their identity? Yes, it's in there. You know, the, the, the answers are out there. The connections are out there. You have to look for it, right? And be respectful of that. It's not just an idea of like, oh, you know what? Hey, I have indigenous heritage. I'm going to like stick a feather in my ear and then, you know, go out to a power. No, talk to people. 
right? Talk to people who are involved in the culture. Talk to your family. If you don't have that family, find someone else. But there are people out there that you can connect with. And, you know, remember, who were the first alliances in this hemisphere against oppression? It was black and brown people or red people, you know, redskins, right? That term that was first applied in the Caribbean because our folks used to paint ourselves completely red using a, using a, a little uh, seed pod called biha, you know, as achote today. And they would paint themselves red, not only for decorative ceremonial purposes, but also practical purpose because that biha, right, would also... Um, allow them to uh, be allow also function as a mosquito repellent. There's a lot of mosquitoes in the Caribbean, right? So they would paint themselves completely red like that, and that would be uh, a, a place where this term redskins uh, first uh, came up. As we move across and the colonization takes place across the hemisphere, you find that term redskins being used more and more in a derogatory way, which is why so many of us are against that sports team name. Uh, the Redskins. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Um, yes, uh, people are agreeing. One person asks, how do you learn the Taino language? Well, there's various organizations that have their uh, language programs. The UCTP, as I mentioned, the Confederation, that's the organization that I work mainly with, has a language program, and you could find out, uh, connect on Facebook or in you know through the UCT website to get some insight into that. Do you eat cook any traditional food? Of course, so many traditional food. Has anyone ever had uh, pasteles? If you're from uh, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, pasteles are, are originally from the indigenous peoples. The same way that uh, you, you know you find tamales in the the, um, the Mesoamerican cultures, we had our form of tamale, which is the pastela. At that time, the main things would be used: yuca, yautia all these indigenous uh, words that are still, we still identify those root tubers and, and, and other ingredients by those words. And they would make these things, wrap them in leaves the same way. But of course, you know, as the, the, the population in the islands, uh, the demographic changes, other things are added, which is why you find things that are not uh, things that would have been used 500 years ago in pasteles, right? But that's one thing. There's the ajiaco, the, 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 uh, corn soup with, with hot peppers, you know, the pepper sauce. Many people say that uh, they understand that in Jamaica, jerk chicken, right, comes from the spices that were used originally by, in Jamaica, they used to say Arawaks, right? But now they know that the Arawaks were part also the Taino, right? And so uh, you find that culinary uh, influence there. There's so much. I mean, in Puerto Rico, we have guanine, the, the, the use of fruits, making the, the chicha, which is related to some of our relatives in, in South America, you know, the, the, this corn and, and fermented drinks from, from corn and, and other and other substances. So um, let's see. Uh, what's another one? I think we have, this will probably be about the last question. And again, relationship between Tainos and Carib. Carib, yeah, Mavi, that's another one. My grandfather used to make that on the, on the, uh, on the stoop in Manhattan, when he came over from the island to work, Mavi is like a drink, and they used to prepare that, and he used to do that, so we used to have that as well. I was just talking about that with my with my father this weekend, uh, over, over this Father's Day weekend, about how uh, Grandpa used to make that Mavi uh, at home. Uh, let's see. There was one here. Um, are there a relationship between Tainos and Caribs? One, I uh, mentioned that in the past we were related, uh, there's stories about how people coming up from the Lesser Antilles had uh, treaties already, and this is pre-European uh, treaties with people on the larger islands. There was interchange. Was there some skirmishes? Yes, but it was not like the evil Caribs, the man-eating Caribs, and the peaceful Arawaks. That's the mythology that was built on, the same kind of mythology that lets people think that Columbus is somebody to be glorified today. Uh, I think that's the last one. I think there's a few slides that uh, JCal, uh, the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, wants to put up at the end. I th thank you very much for listening to me talk over this past hour and a half. And, um, oh, somebody's saying Jamaican bammies. I had those when I visited Jamaica. They're just like cassava bread in the other ones. That's, again, another part of the traditional uh, diet. But um, I guess... Uh, I can end here. I want to just say thank you to JCal, thank you to Kate, thank you to Ben for helping me with the slides and doing all this technical work. 
Uh, it's so important. There's another uh, number of uh, online programs coming up uh, from, from JCal. Please tune in to those. They're going to be fascinating and interesting as, as well. Uh, you'll get that, that information online. There's a survey that they want you to uh, take. If you can uh, do that, I think they're going to have that. Maybe add the link there for you. But uh, anything, I put up my uh, Instagram and my um, my Twitter. It's just mucaro.borero at Instagram and mucaro.borero at Twitter if you want to connect with me that way. And uh, until next time, I say thank you. And uh, I really look forward to another time or another opportunity to be able to share with you all. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We'll see you next time.